Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I am George Osborne. Please get your jokes out of the way early. Let's just go for it. Just, just feel free. If you've got anything, shout it out now. Excellent. Fantastic. Love me. Oh, thank you. That's a, thank you, Alice. Very kind of you. But anyway, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about football manager and about why players of football manager fall in love with their players in ridiculous and hard to understand ways. So has anyone in here played football manager? Have any of you at any point gotten a shirt from one of the teams that you've loved? Any of you done that? No, not, not you haven't done that, but I know people who have. And this is what we're going to be talking about. But before we get to that point, I just want to talk about why football fans are just affectionate about players in the first place. Because once you start understanding a bit about that, you start understanding why people fall in love with players in the virtual world. So I'm going to tell you a story. I don't think any of you thought you were going to hear about Argentinian footballers in the 1970s tonight. But, oh boy, let's get going. So, this man here, his name is Aldo Poi. He is a player who played for Rosario Central in the 1970s. Now, Rosario were one of the original Argentinian football clubs founded in the, I think it's late 1800s, early 1900s. And essentially, they went 70 years without winning any trophies at all. But they come to this really important match. It's the semi-final of the Premier Division. And they are one game away from the final. And they know the two teams that they could possibly face in the final are absolutely rubbish. So all they have to do is beat this other team who are called Newell Old Boys. Now, they are Rosario's city rivals. So this is a derby. So this is a really important game. It's nil-nil. It's really tense. And then suddenly, the ball gets whipped into the box. And Poi does what's called the Palomita. It's a diving header. So he just leaps at the ball, smacks it on his head. It goes in. Everyone celebrates wildly. So this is the 19th of December, 1971. This is the 19th of December, 1996, because now Poi recreates the Palomita every single year in Rosario. What happens is, genuinely, he secretly arranges where he's going to do it. The fans of Rosario find out over the course of maybe a couple of months, but it gets announced on the day. Then everyone rushes to this spot to watch someone throw a football at him, and then he does a diving header on the 19th of December every year, which is fantastic. But what is even better is that not every year you're going to get the chance to see him. One year, he was abroad, so he did it abroad, obviously. But if you cannot see him do the Palomita in the real world, you're encouraged, if you're out on the 19th of December with a group of mates in the pub, someone just says, I'm doing the Palomita. You throw a ball, he does a diving header. Everyone has a great time. And that's it. And, you know, people fall in love with their football players. And there's kind of, there's this sort of three-part, I guess, phase to falling in love with players. There's the original action, which they do, which is like scoring a goal or scoring lots of goals. That leads to people initially celebrating it and going, yes, I love you, Poi. And then it leads further down the line to like commemoration. And if you get to the point of commemoration, you know that someone has really made an impact. And Mr. Poi, I had not heard of him until the end of last year, but my goodness me, I love this man now. And the key thing is, is that I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know what, when people fall in love with players and football manager, that's exactly what happens. And I want to show you how that happens. But before I show you how, I'm going to sort of explain to you why football manager is a game that really encourages this. So... This is Sky Sports News, and this is from a couple of years ago. They started using football manager stats, which are compiled by thousands and thousands of people who do it in their spare time across the world to rate hundreds of thousands of players who go into the game. So when you are playing football manager or when you are entering the football manager game and creating your database and loading everything up, you're essentially creating like a carbon copy of the footballing world as it is in August of the season of the game. So what you do is you set up this alternate reality where you've got all of these real people in it and you can go in there and you can start playing around with it. So you load up Football Manager, you pick your team and you're cranking on the lever. Welcome to my reality. Welcome to me affecting the world of football. And you can go into that and you get this wonderful environment where you start creating your own story. You are the person. It's like an RPG where you take on the role of a particular manager and you just go and live and you affect this world and you watch it change and you get to do things like this, which is me having beef with Jose Mourinho. Because I tell you something, that man is a dickhead. He's a complete 
bastard. And we lost to Manchester United three times in a row because I was in charge of Crystal Palace. And frankly, anyone who knows anything about football know that Crystal Palace are rubbish. But... But in my most recent match against him, we beat them 1-0. And so what I did in the very, very sort of, you know, polite manner was, I don't want to distract from the results at all, but on a personal level, I'm pleased. Because as well as the win, it might mean a moment silence for Mourinho too. And you see, that's it. And it's just like, there are these brilliant worlds where you feel like you're in control. You get this chance to sign your team, train them up, send them out, and you win all of the games, right? Well, not really. Because this is a game, right? And once you get going, you've got these instruction things at the top. So you can set instructions like get the ball wide or you can make your team play a little bit wider or whatever. But when you're giving the instructions, it's actually the players who are carrying them out. And the thing is, sometimes players do stupid things. Sometimes players ignore you. Sometimes, I don't know, like in one of my more recent games, one of your players decides to pass the ball into the back of his own net. Fucking idiot. Um, and so you've got this abstraction where... You are the manager, you are in control, but you are not fully in control. So to actually be able to be successful in this game, you need to create relationships. And you need to create relationships with your squad, with your players who form your team. And you get to do this in a number of different ways. So one of them is having private conversations. So this is one of the official screenshots. Um, this is, I don't know, Baldy McBaldface. Um, he's having a chat with Gerard De Lefeu, and he said to him, you know, Gerard, I don't think you're good enough for the first team. I'm going to leave you out. And Gerard is kicking off. He's going, you're being unfair here. This is absolutely ridiculous. Don't you know who I am? I've played eSports once. Yeah, I was at the Overwatch launch because I'm a footballer. Um, and the thing is, is that you have this opportunity to have these conversations with these people. And this is your chance to G them up, get them on side. If you have the right kind of conversations with players, then they become more motivated and they're more likely to do things for you. If you have bad conversations, you see his motivation goes down, his morale goes down. And as the morale goes down, they're more likely to make mistakes, get complacent, not care about what you're doing. So you have to build relationships with them on a personal level. But then you also have to build relationships with them on a tactical level. So this is kind of like a bastardization of the tactics screen. So what you do is you set up your players and you put them in all of these different positions to decide what they're doing. As some of you will know, I'm not playing with a striker because I'm a footballing hipster. And I am, I tell you, it's just like, I'm the, uh, this is the flat white of footballing tactics. But <laughs> what you've got to do here is, so this sort of shows you how much each player is happy with the particular role you've given them. So every player has a particular role, such as a winger. And a winger would go down the wing and cross the ball a lot. That's what they do. If they're happy and comfortable doing it, you get green. If they're not, you get a red. And that's generally a bad thing. You also have something called tactical familiarity, which I haven't been able to show here, which is another bar, which shows it grows over time. So the more you have these players playing in these positions, the happier they get with them. So you want to have them building relationships with their teammates and with your coaching staff so they understand tactics better. And then lastly, you need to think about how these tactics and how these roles and duties fit together. So I'm sorry, I'm going to have to talk football at you very, very quickly. But the reason why I set this team up like this is because Max Crusoe here is a legend but this is his best position and so as a shadow striker the defenders the central defenders here are going oh hang on a second he's not he's not standing next to me I'm gonna have to come close to him and mark him because otherwise he's gonna be free to do all sorts of shenanigans so the defenders come out at which point I'm like Casper mate you're an inside forward inside forwards sneak inside that is the plan so when the guy goes there to max you go in there, Casper. And to give you a bit of support, I've got Charlie here, Charlie Taylor. He's going down the, down the outside. So if you can't go down the middle, knock the ball to win, whip it across, we've got ourselves a goal. Yes. So you have to think about those relationships as well when you're trying to construct things to succeed. And then lastly, and my favorite thing, favored personnel. So I've not got a screenshot of it here, but what can happen is Frank and Johan can become best friends. And they can list each other as favoured personnel. And if they become favourite personnel of one another, they play better together. So you find people who are friends with one another and you find people who like you. Because certain players decide they like you as a manager and then they start playing better for you. So you have to build up all of these wonderful relationships with people to be successful. So this is the reason why people start getting attached to their players. 
Before I start showing you how I've got an attached sperm players, I want to show you the worst person in humanity. Mauro Icardi. He is a terrible human being. There are lots of reasons for that. In the real world, he is actually a terrible human being as well. Uh, <laughs> He had a very public affair with one of his teammates' wives. That man then left to go to another football club, and now there is the Maxi Lopez Mauro Icardi derby, where the two players play against each other and quite clearly will kick each other in the face if given an opportunity. But in my particular instance, I was manager at Inter Milan, and I went into the club first week, and he says, I want to transfer. And it's just like, oh, give me a chance, mate. You know, I've barely, barely gone in here. And he's just like, I want to transfer. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'll try and get rid of you. And I couldn't get rid of him initially because no one was willing to pay the money for him. So he got upset. He made all of my, uh, rest of my team upset. He then eventually left on a transfer. And they got even more upset because he was my best player. And they were like, why did you sell him? And it's just like, because he's an asshole. Because he hates me. I can't help this. So... In some instances, the relationships don't go well. And my advice, as with any bad relationship in life, is sell them as quickly as possible to top. <laughs> that was actually remarkably good for me. I'm really, really pleased with that. Anyway, um, so anyway, let's go for some people that I love and the various reasons why I love them. So there's a first category of people you love in Football Manager, which is real-life footballers who are kind of established, who you know are going to be good. You bring them into your team and you feel happy. This man is genuinely called Geronimo. Um, Geronimo Ruli. Um, he is the goalkeeper at Real Sociedad. I had him in goal for my Benfica team in Football Manager 2016. I only had him for one year. It was like a holiday romance. Um, he kept 20 clean sheets and was just generally a sound lad. And you get this kind of attachment to these people and you're like, you know what? I love you, Geronimo. I love you. I've then got Raphael van der Vaart. So this is the next category of people that you fall in love with, which is young players which are described as wonder kids in the game, who are like undiscovered gems, who you bring into your football manager team, they turn your team into a world-class thing, and then you spend the rest of your life walking around in the day-to-day -day life going, yeah, mate, uh, your team in the real world, it needs to sign, insert wonder kid name, because it's going to make you well good. Raphael van der Vaart was one of my first wonder kids. He was a championship manager, 03, 04. He was 18. I would sign him for my acts. Within two years, he was club captain of my various teams. And he was just generally brilliant. You know, he could create, he could score. He was the kind of person who you would just generally trust in life. So you have these groups of players who you love as well. The next group of players that you love, because so far I've shown you actual real people who you sort of discover that you have feelings for them. The next group of people are completely fake. So these are the ones who are completely made up by the game because as with the passage of time in football, you see that people retire, they stop playing the game. So to keep the game stocked full of players, they have this thing called the regen system where fake people basically come through the youth team and they populate your youth team and you have to try and start scouting these weirdos, particularly Jensen here. I mean, look at those eyes. I mean, Jesus, it's terrifying. Um, but you have to scout through these weirdos with terrible hair, like Rakitic. And you have to find the ones who are good and bring them through and nurture them. And you get this paternal sense of sort of love towards these people. I had one guy called Dean Sims. He was football manager 2009. I signed him from Charlton. I thought he was a lad with real potential. On his debut, he scored two goals against Chelsea in a 2-1 win. And I was like, Dean, I love you, man. I love you, man. You're going to be a superstar one day. And he was a superstar because I made sure he was. And I absolutely loved that. So you get that kind of sense of paternal love with all regens. But you get particular paternal love with the regens who are actually your son. Yeah, you can have your virtual son in the game if you get lucky. It's a one in 1,000 chance every year. But there is the possibility that in your youth academy, you will actually get your own son come through. This has happened so rarely. I have never had my own son, but Dom Lowe did have his own son when he was manager of Manchester United. He had Paul Lowe, who unfortunately was terrible. <laughs> But, like every good football manager, what he did was he acted decisively and made sure that he played every single match. <laughs> or in this case, 
he put posts up on a Facebook group called FM Central, which is, it's a sort of a fans, fan group thing. And he was updating about the fact that Paulo, surprisingly, didn't get called up to the England squad, mostly because he was rubbish. So he was actually going to attend Reading and Leeds Festival instead in 2018. So you've got that next level of love, which is an actual paternal sense of love by the fact that you get these people in there. But, you know, when we were talking about Mr. Poy earlier, what was really notable wasn't the fact that he had just done stuff in the past and he had done something amazing and that was the reason why he, you know, everyone loved him. People loved him because they managed to keep on generating that love. They managed to commemorate and do much more with it. And this is where I think it becomes really spectacular and really interesting. It's seeing what people do after, you know, the games have gone and how people remember them because people take the virtual love that they've got for these players and they move them into the physical world. So I've not got a screenshot of the group, but Tonton Zolo Makuku. He is an actual, that's an actual real name. I'd just like to just point that out first to any of you sniggering at the back. Um, he was in Championship Manager 0102 and was one of the wonder kids. Everyone loved him. Everyone thought he was going to be a superstar. He wasn't. He was rubbish. He was actually terrible, and he disappeared off the face of the earth in footballing terms. But in the football manager community, there are fan appreciation pages for Tonton Zola Makuku with thousands of members. There are articles where people have gone to interview him to ask him about being famous at football manager. There are similar articles about other failed players like Cherno Samba, Mark Kerr. Anyone? Any names in any recognition here? Oh, I mean, I think I saw one nodding head, and I'm like, thank God, thank God I'm not the only one to have heard about these legends and heroes. Um, so there's that first layer, there's this kind of in-game cult, and, you know, the whole community gets behind these sort of particular cult figures. The next one, it's the kind of individual love story. So this is a man, I think his name is Jim. I can't actually remember his name, but... The Set Pieces, which is a footballing website, hosted a Football Manager Cup, and everyone got drawn a random team, and he got drawn FC Utrecht. And when he got drew that team, he said, he tweeted at FC Utrecht saying, if I win this tournament, I want you to give me two VIP tickets to come and see the club. And they said, deal. And do you want to know what, ladies and gentlemen? He bloody well won it. He went and won it. And FC Utrecht actually honoured this. They also gave him the chance to meet some of the players from his team, including the awkward moment where he had to explain to one person why he hadn't picked him throughout the entire <laughs> run to the trophy. <laughs> but there are stories galore of people doing things like this. That one of my friends went to go and see Red Bull Leipzig last week. That's his current team and football manager who's been managing for the past five years. I once got giddily excited when I saw a Chilean winger called Matthias Fernandez come on the football pitch during a game I saw in Italy once. And my girlfriend was like, why are you excited about this? And it's just like, this is going to take far too long to explain. <laughs> and then there are, of course, the people who actually have player names on the back of certain shirts. So some people have had imaginary generated players come through the ranks, be heroes for them. So they've gotten their name and number on the back of the club shirt that they were playing for and actually now own that shirt. That is, that is a true story. But, you know, beyond all of this stuff, you know, there are actually some more interesting, more profound things. And I'm going to try and end a little bit on this note. So this is Avicja Strock. He is an imaginary Croatian striker who went on to become the best player in the world while playing for Celtic in 2030. Uh, he is the striker who was, he was playing for the Celtic team managed by Johnny Sharples, who is a guy who is you know, quite well known in the football manager community. And the reason why the Avicja Strock story is you know, really memorable is that actually there's, there's quite a lot of sadness to it, is that when Johnny was playing football manager at the time, his brother committed suicide. And Avicja, for him, and that particular team, was a way that he dealt with that. So Avicja Strock now, he's got his own Twitter account, he's got a Wikipedia page, he's helped raise 5,000 pounds for Mind. You know, they use him as a way of raising awareness of that issue. And so, you know, when it comes down to it, why do people end up falling in love with players in Football Manager? It's for the same reason that you end up falling in love with players just in football in general. You know, they mean something to you. It sounds so silly, it sounds ridiculous, especially if you're not a football fan, where you sort of see these people sitting there every weekend in the stadium, sometimes supporting whole city, and you're like, how do you do that? How do you deal with that? But it's because there is this emotion attached to it, and it's so personal and so intimate in a way, you can't really fully make sense of it. But I think that's kind of where I want to end it, except, as many of you will have noticed, 
the opening slide said, much Freddie Adu about nothing. And I didn't reference this pun at all. And that's because Freddie Adu was one of these famous wonder kids who became to prominence in about 2007. He also failed, but I wanted to save him for the end because I've got a picture of him with a can of soup. <laughs> oh, it's chicken noodle soup as well, so it's not even the good one. He's now also a club promoter. So, you know, he didn't succeed in the world of football, but he is very much a marketing genius. Thank you very much. Thank you.